Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, good evening for those of you who might be joining us from India and really good day for whatever time of the day you're listening to this. Uh, most of people who have a chance to listen to these conversations do it uh, off uh, offline. My name is Ashish Jha and I'm super excited to be back for my monthly conversations with the Dean series. Um, and before I get started, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping uh, stuff. This is being recorded for later viewing and will be shared on all of our websites. Um, during this live conversation, feel free to submit your uh, questions through the Q&A box at any time. My goal is to have a sort of conversation with our guests today for about 30 minutes and then really start taking uh, questions and, and, we and weaving them into the broader discussion. Um, today, I'm really excited to have Dr. Sapna Desai. Uh, she is a public health researcher, a practitioner based at the Population Council in New Delhi, uh, India. She focuses on women's health, community-based interventions, and health systems and how to think about them. Uh, she's a graduate of Brown. She got her master's degree from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and she has a PhD in epidemiology and population health from LSHTM, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, I'm not gonna go talk much more about her uh, bio, which is available on the website for this, uh, for this event, but I just wanna start off by saying, I'm really thrilled that we have Dr. Desai with us. Sapna, thank you for joining us this morning and uh, really excited to, to have you part of this conversation. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure. I so, wish I could be that person. I know, I do too, that would be great. Uh, that would be great, but, but thrilled to have you virtually and, and uh, and we will find a time to do this in person uh, as travel kind of kicks back up. So I, I actually want to start off by asking you, if you don't mind, I very briefly mentioned that you're a graduate of Brown and have gotten your degrees, but talk to us a little bit about your journey in public health. You didn't begin in public health when you were at Brown, um, and yet you are deeply immersed in public health and, and, and healthcare uh, now. Talk to us about your personal journey, how you went from your time at Brown uh, to where you are today. Great. Um, well, it started out, as you're absolutely right, it didn't start out with public health. I enrolled at Brown um, in the PLME. So I was on my route to become a doctor through an amazing medical program. I'm sure you all know it. Uh, but when I got to Brown, and I'd like to really focus on that. I think Brown is an incredibly unique place and I'm always so happy to engage with the university because what Brown did in my undergraduate, I studied international relations. So start starting right there, despite going to medical school after, I wasn't forced to take a typical pre-med route, but rather I was able to study the humanities and I was in IR. And in IR, what used to be called North-South at that point, really thinking about international development. And through that path, I was exposed to so much in terms of critical thinking. You were constantly pushed to think differently about traditional debates in international relations. And my lens was always on health. So I kept applying that lens to health. And Brown gave me this opportunity to take classes in you know, critical theory in development, for example. I took a class, uh, I remember Professor McGarvey on infectious diseases globally. I was able to take classes in women's health and women's rights. And what it did was open up a world that didn't exist even in traditional public health. And I really, really um, am grateful to Brown because of its sort of really strong emphasis on A, critical thinking, and B, I think going against the mainstream. Um, it forced me to really reconsider my own direction. So when I was, um, I think in my last year, I did my, my dissertation because as, again, you're allowed to pick, you know, even outside of IR, I did a dissertation looking at the history of population policy of WHO. And again, non-traditional for a traditional IR major, but that was allowed. And I realized right then and there that, you know, this was reproductive health, this was public health, and this is what I had fallen in love with. So the Dean at the medical school at the time was incredibly supportive of my own journey as well, which I'm again grateful to, to say, well, if you're not ready to go to medical school, why don't you step back and take your time? So when I was at Brown, something else, the Howard Swear Center supported public service um, internships, and I chose to do one in India, where I'm from, but the Self-Employed Women's Association, which is again, an organization I discovered at Brown through speakers and through classes and through some of my readings. And SEVA, as it's called, is uh, the largest trade union of women uh, globally for women workers in the informal economy. It is the first union that really came together 
um, for women workers who are, you know, who you see selling vegetables on the street, agricultural laborers. So I had gone and worked there and I saw what it really meant to do public health work at the grassroots. I was able to write about it when I came back and I was able to really um, explore what that meant to do public health work in India on the ground. So right after Brown, I left and I went um, to Seva in India. I spent a couple of years, I, and this can be part of a, another conversation, I think, kind of looking for what a public health job meant, because actually there is no path and there is no real definition. And I realized despite being in India, I was so far from what we typically call the field. So despite being in Delhi, I, I actually couldn't get to programs. So I kept trying to leave, I kept trying to leave, and it was only Seva that gave me that opportunity to actually implement programs and design programs with women. Um, so it goes without saying, I never came back to the medical school. <laughs> Instead, while I was working at Seva, I went and I did a master's um, in public health and then did a PhD much later, about 10 years later, while I was still working and really doing very grassroots work on the ground, yet had this sort of view where I could see um, global work as well because of where Seva was situated, but also, I guess, because of my own background, I was able to interact with global health organizations and public health professionals around the world. So my journey is, you know, to end that, it's a sort of strange one, but I don't think it's strange at all for, for Brown. <laughs> you know, I think everyone I knew at Brown took a really interesting route that forced you to ask questions along the way and be really critical of even how public health was practiced, um, which is what sent me right to the grassroots before I ended up where I am today. So it's, thank you, that's very helpful. And, 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 and what I would love to actually just build on a little bit in, in your answer um, is this issue of something we think a lot about at, at our school, but I think it's something we don't do enough of in public health which is this idea of learning by doing and kind of being deeply engaged on the front lines. Um, you've clearly kind of bounced back and forth. You were working on the ground, then you came and got your master's, you got a doctoral degree. How do you feel like your on the ground experience shaped your educational experience? We often talk about how, on the, you know, how education is obviously really important to, to doing field work and to understanding the broader context, but how do you think your field work actually shape your educational experience, both at Harvard and LSHTM? Mm -hmm. I think um, well, public health is a field of practice, and I think we forget that quite often. Um, so even in places like HSPH and LSHTM, being a practitioner, I will be honest, when I was there, I often felt um, like there were two parallel tracks going on in my own intellectual development because on one hand I came from a world of practice where I saw a lot of these theories that we think about in health don't play out necessarily on the ground or there's other factors involved that are outside of health. That said, um, I think it is absolutely critical for anyone who's working in public health, whether you're a researcher, a practitioner, a policymaker, to have really been engaged and continue to engage with practice because you know we are a field of practice even in research i think it shaped most of the way i develop questions i don't develop questions only by doing a literature review it's always very consultated with people and with practitioners because that's where i think the most interesting research questions emerge so for me it was absolutely critical and i think shaped how i think about the field I don't think we're there yet, though, in a lot of traditional schools of public health in terms of valuing that. There is often a sense of, well, are you here or are you in the field? And, and I don't think that dichotomy needs to exist. So let's actually talk about that a bit more mm -hmm. because it, you know, we have, even within academia, we have sort of our professors and then we have our professors mm -hmm. of the practice. And we think of uh, these as really separate things. There are kind of academic intellectual scholars and then there are practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, and what I hear from you is that maybe we need to push both sides to be a bit more expansive in their own vision of what their domain covers. Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, I would say exactly the same. And I think, to, you know, you can use concrete examples. So I often, I'm editing a journal, I often get papers based in India from researchers who analyze data and know the literature, 
But the interpretation, you can always see the teams that are different when they engage very deeply in practice, either as individuals or with teams of people who are actually engaged in practice. When you think of the implications of research, you're just that much better of a researcher yep. when you're actually really engaged a, in the context and b, in what these implications really mean. So you don't end with that super dry implication section that doesn't really mean very much often. Yep. And you see the difference. I mean, I see it all the time, I'm just reviewing papers from a bird's eye view. So that's one I think for researchers and for practitioners, it was interesting, a lot of practitioners I still work with in India now as a researcher, really, um, they keep researchers at an arm's length yeah. because they find that there's this sense of either being extractive or just you know, putting theories on us and not engaging with us on equal ground. And it is something I see play out in India, and I'm sure this happens globally. So this happens you know, on a micro level in India, and then certainly when you talk about people coming from outside of the country in, you, you know, these, these power structures that exist, there is a hierarchy. And I think practitioners have to figure out with researchers together a way that we engage um, more clearly. Yeah, look, look, one quick clarifying que mm -hmm. or point, and then one question for you. Um, mm -hmm. So my sense has been, and this is a question as much as it is a statement, mm -hmm. my sense has been that when you have people who either understand practice or, or have practiced themselves or work with a team of practitioners, their implication sections are different, but also the questions they ask are a little bit different, right? They, they are quite the, one of the challenges of academia that has struck me is that the questions are often esoteric and not really impactful because people don't have a good sense of what practitioners on the, on the ground, whether they are policymakers or frontline clinicians and frontline public health practitioners, uh, what the questions are that they need answered. Do you, do you agree with that? 100%. I mean, I think the questions tend to be also not necessarily what is the flavor of that time in terms yeah. of donors are interested in necessarily. I mean, I, I face that a lot. We, we often come with questions that no one's interested in funding. Well, these are questions that have emerged from practice. Right. So years ago, for example, Seva, we really wanted to do work on non-communicable diseases. And people said, working amongst the poorest women of the country. And we said, well, we're seeing it. We yeah. are seeing this. We had some data. It wasn't population level data, but you know, the, those were the, the gut instincts that you get from seeing practice. But at that point, everyone said it's maternal health or nothing yeah. in terms yeah. of research funding. Right, right. Um, okay, I want to shift a little mm -hmm. bit to talking about Population Council, uh, obviously mm -hmm. a really international mm -hmm. organization. Well, it goes well beyond their work in India, which is quite substantial. Can you talk a little bit, just give us a little bit of a, a primer on what the Population Council does? What are the, some of the major focus areas? And then really a bit of, more about what it has focused on in India. Absolutely, thanks for that question. So the Population Council was founded um, I guess I would say in the 50s, I, I don't want to say the wrong date because That's Peter right. Donaldson, who was a former president, um, is also a Brown alum, and he may be watching, but it was founded years ago to really address the most pressing population issues facing the world at the time, but I think the Pop Council's view from the outset from its inception was that population and development are intertwined um, quite naturally. So the work that the Pop Council has done over the last 60 some years or more has been, or well, more now, but has been around, um, I suppose three key areas. So in reproductive health, particularly in family planning, both in terms of developing the actual technologies, a lot of women um, controlled uh, technologies for reproductive health, so for birth control, for example, contraception, as well as doing population level research on reproductive health, been real pioneers in the area of quality of care in family planning, for example. Another area has been HIV, a lot of really strong both population level work as well as operations work um, around the world. We work in over 50 countries, so the work is really spread out, and I think it's a great example of an organization that is not only centered um, in the quote unquote North or centered in its offices and headquarters in New York and DC, because I see it from a country office in India. I mean, I can really see that the power structures, I think it's, it's experimenting with ways in which a lot of international organizations need to be thinking about um, quite carefully. And then the third area it works on is around adolescence and poverty and gender. So really looking at Adolescent girls in particular, but adolescents and looking at gender issues through that lens. But the work uh, country to country really varies, which I think is again, very important. 
because priorities are different country to country. So in India, we also work on violence against women. We work on health systems in India. I do a lot of work on women's groups in India. So each country has different focus areas depending on local need as well. So it's not um, determined either by one international donor nor um, headquarters. Great. I'm going to ask a um, question that it's meant to be provocative, but I hope it's not disrespectful, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, if you look globally, and then I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about this link between family planning and development, mm -hmm. um, which I think is really important and interesting. If you look internationally at countries, countries that have high levels of development uh, tend to have, you know, pretty effective, like the number of kids that, that women have obviously goes down as development goes up. Um, family planning access gets much better. Health systems mm -hmm. get better. So one argument that some people make, and I just want to hear you your response to this, is all of this focus is fine, but shouldn't we just primarily be focused on development? Shouldn't we just focus on economic development? And won't all these things kind of happen naturally as a consequence? Do we really need to be focused on family planning and these kinds of services? Or aren't they just a consequence of economic development? And isn't that the most important issue? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think this has been the subject of a lot of debate over decades. I will take a view from India on purpose because I think India has been at the center of a lot of these questions. And I think if you look across Indian states, what's interesting is that you can see a variation based on education, see variation based on where women's status is higher and where women's rights have been sort of either embedded within sort of norms or society or legal rights for that matter. Yep. So, it, I mean, the direction has never been, I think, unidirectional. You've seen also women's, it's, it's not just about family planning. And I think the International Conference on Population Development, ICPD, um, which, you know, in 94 still, still should steer us when we think about putting rights at the center and the rights of people to be able to freely choose, because what you're doing is then not just talking about access to a service, but rather access to an entire set of choices. And that makes health systems think a bit differently. Economic development on its own could, for example, um, improve education, but that's not been the case necessarily, even if I look at variation across India, um, where fertility has gone down with education, but not necessarily economic development. So I think it's a, it's important to kind of turn that on its head and really think about what health, improved health and well-being actually do for economic development. One classic argument coming out of where you used to be for sure, but also thinking about when we put rights at the center, thinking about what that actually means in practice. It's easier to write than to actually see how health systems could be oriented that way. And we have seen that in practice and a lot of variation um, by economic status that makes you wonder, it's obviously just not economics alone. Yeah. I hope that helps. No, that's really helpful. And, and in fact, it, one of the things that um, while you, and, and I was being a little bit provocative on purpose, but part of it is you, if you just look at straight correlation, obviously there's a correlation mm -hmm. between economic mm -hmm. development and, and women's health and access to reproductive health. But if you look at things over time, um, you realize there's a, it's a lot more bi-directional, right? That yes, economic development is really helpful uh, for health, but it turns out that investments in health and family planning uh, actually is really helpful for economic development, as you said, and that they actually go, uh, they go hand in hand. I'm gonna actually use that to pivot um, to a question that I have been thinking about for a long time and don't have good answers, and I'd love your reflections which is for years, as I have looked at the Indian health system and as I have talked to Indian health policymakers, I have been struck at uh, the lack of investments in health in India. That if you look at health spending as a proportion of GDP, um, it remains very, very low. Uh, if you look at public spending as a, you know, of, on health as a percent of GDP, it's exceedingly low. Much of it, the spending that is happening is private out of pocket. Um, and the argument I've been making is essentially a version of the argument you just made, which is that these investments actually have serious long-term benefits on not just health, but on economic development because a healthier, and more productive, you know, healthier workforce is a more productive workforce. I don't feel like it got a lot of traction. Why do you think, um, what do you think has held back uh, investments in health in India and particularly public investments uh, for the poor? And, and I will just add one more caveat. 
that we have seen changes. I mean, we've seen, you know, JSY and we've seen other kind of programs that have tried to like uh, focus on um, providing coverage for people. So it's not like there's nobody listening and nobody's trying. There has been movement, but it has not been as much as I would like to see. And I wonder, A, do you agree with that? And also, what do you think has held back uh, kind of investments in India? So it's something I think it's important to look back historically also at that. I mean, it's not, I mean, they have investment in health has improved, I think, in two ways, quantitatively, of course, but qualitatively in terms of where investments are going. But I always answer questions about India when we think of India as a whole is look, India, the diversity is so great at a state level that if you look at some of the performance of some states in India, like Kerala and like Tamil Nadu, I mean, you see incredible indicators and incredible improvements over time. Not, I mean, there's greater investment, but not necessarily, it's, it's also how the, the funds are used and how investments have been directed. So I think the question really then comes to is what is held back India? Well, it's obviously been not just health, it's also been in education where we've had you know, low investments. I just heard an argument the other day, but there's still the fiscal space issue, of course, but also the political priority for health which has been higher in certain states, you see that pan out. Um, there's a great analysis just done that just came out last month that really looked at differential levels of spending by state in India and found a much higher use of the public sector in those states. So you're not you're seeing lower out-of-pocket expenditure coming to what you're talking about in terms of households. So I think where we need to think about moving forward is of course increasing investments, but looking at the states in India that have really successfully been able to perform and perform well um, by making investments in certain ways. And I think Tamil Nadu is a fantastic example of a state that has made incredible strides over time in improving its health system with a very clear view of what a health system should look like. Robust public system, robust primary care, um, it, you know, community level institutions aren't as strong there, but they've ensured that you have these networks of house to house delivery, for example. So, um, so the, the first kind of a question, I don't think anyone has a good answer on the why, except perhaps political priority that has changed with COVID for sure, in terms yep. of health really being on the news daily and in the newspapers daily. Um, but at the same time, we need to learn much more about why states have performed much better. Yeah, and it, it reminds me, it's a great point, and it reminds me of a conversation I had uh, with a former health secretary who said, we were talking about health in India, and I sort of was um, simplistic in my question, much in the way that I was with you, and he basically gave me the, the same answer, but he, but he said, you know, India is a country that has health outcomes that look like uh, parts of Europe, and we have, a, we are a country where we have health outcomes that look worse in many places in sub-Saharan Africa. And so I don't know which India you are talking about, but we should talk about all of those Indias. And that was a very, very good point um, that we do see this massive diversity within India. It really is a subcontinent in that way. Um, I wanna stay on this a bit longer and then I'll talk about how you think COVID has changed things. Um, so obviously when you look at places like Kerala and Tamil Nadu, and, and the, the really great metrics, great health outcomes, uh, population level. Um, some of it is clearly about, about public investments, just more dollars or rupees as it were. Um, what else do you think explains their better outcomes beyond money? Meaning if we took the same investments in Bihar and Jharkhand, I think we'd agree, we probably wouldn't get the exact same level of outcomes. So there are other factors that may be at play as well. Can you just help us sort of think about what else you think beyond and beyond financial resources drives these kind of variations in outcomes across India? Well, I mean, this takes me back to, I think the origins of my education in public health were in international relations. I mean, we have to think about health, not in a vacuum of health, right? It has, it's deeply political. It is linked to a range of social determinants and even health outcomes for that matter. I mean, there's no health outcome, but there's such a clean line uh, between investment and improved outcomes. So I think when we look at certain states in India, and I'm not going to repeat uh, Brenda Singh's work here, when we look at the kind of different um, communities and political identities in states. But I do think what's interesting is even within states, the variation, when we start thinking about what's different, um, I think what those two states have done differently, if we use those two examples, 
isn't just um, the money. It's been investing in the right human resources, the technical expertise, really strong in-house at the state level um, technical expertise. It's not necessarily just reliant on donors, for example, bringing in a sort of technocratic view that people really embedded in the system. I also think this happened over time. Now, places like Kerala and Tamil Nadu also have high literacy. So that reflects both a, 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 um, a political priority on human development, for sure. But you also, um, I think, have an expectation or a demand from the system, given what people have experienced with other public services. So when we, when we think about pouring money into health, we're not pouring in money into health and just looking at a linear health outcome, but rather looking at the system that's absorbing it. It's not just the health system, yeah. it's the roads, it's the education, it's that whole range of social determinants. So you could do tons for you know, diarrhea, but if the sanitation system is what it is, um, we will continue to struggle. So it's about, I think also at the state level, leaving it for, I mean, as you know, but for the audience, I mean, health is a state subject in India. So you see investments um, play out differently state to state. So I think it's also about ensuring that people can prioritize what matters to that state, both at the social determinants level, as well as, you know, final outcomes. Even comparing UP and Bihar is very interesting in terms yeah. of the use of the private sector. I was just studying UP and Orissa. I'm doing this study across two states and um, really different because you see higher um, public use in Orissa and you see almost only um, private, private in UP. In UP. Yeah. yeah. One more question on this, and then I'm going to switch to talking a little bit about COVID, which I can't believe I've managed to go almost 30 minutes without <laughs> talking about. Maybe, maybe a record for me. Um, so a couple of years ago, a few years ago, there was a New York Times uh, piece where um, the person who was writing it called a bunch of global health experts and said, if you could make one investment to improve global public health, only one, what would you make? And I said, uh, which I think everybody, most people would agree with, and I want to make sure you agree with, but I'd love your thoughts. I said, improve education of girls and young women. Uh, that the evidence on the impact on kind of health over the long run. So it's not a, you know, improve health outcomes in the next 30 days, but if you want to improve health outcomes for over a generation. Um, and what was interesting was the, so most people said, yeah, yeah, that's right. But like, it hasn't really happened in a way that has really, like it's much harder than it looks and it hasn't really had the kind of impact. And so I guess what I would love your thoughts on since you've been thinking about these issues so closely for so long is first of all, do you agree with that as a, as a argument that if you could only make one investment in a place like India, uh, that you would start by investing in education. So it's not even a health intervention. Um, so you agree with that. And then if you agree with that, or even if you don't, I'd love it if you'd humor me hum on the question of mm -hmm. why has it been so hard to really drive that as a major way of improving health of individuals, communities, families, society? Great question. I think at a, at a macro level, sure, I would agree. But then I can name, you know, lots of cities in India with good education indicators or high literacy, and we have pretty poor health outcomes mm. uh, because of a lack of, I mean, depending on which outcomes you're looking at, um, NCDs, for example. Uh, when we look at the crisis sort of that we're facing right now in India, education without primary care, or primary health care, and a real focus on community-based primary health care will only go so far. Of course, there'll be a demand. So I would you know, make the argument that I don't think it's possible, of course, to say one thing anyone would invest in, but I would make the argument that education of women and girls can have an impact on certain types of health outcomes. Um, when we are in a very maternal health sort of centric space, this is where you probably see the most outcomes. And of course, women take care of their children and their families, but these tend to be the outcomes that to me, uh, we need to start really expanding our thinking when we think about global health or health in a specific country. Because if I look at the range of outcomes around you know, through the life course, I'm not sure that education um, is necessarily the variable that differentiates who has better health outcomes. And this is a question, I mean, of things we probably need to study much more. I have um, data on sort of unnecessary surgeries, for example, in India. And it's educated women, urban women. 
So I think we have to think about that a bit more nuanced based on the type of health outcome. That said, of course, I don't think anyone would disagree right. that the education of girls and women is an absolutely critical um, input. But that mechanism in India is also something to think about. So we've had declining female labor force participation. And it's one of the only countries in the world where that is in a U um, relationship. So as education has actually improved over time amongst um, girls and women, young women, we see women in the middle actually dropping out of the labor force. Huh. So and what's going actually, on there? Well, that's the thing. So, you know, whether it's health or labor uh, force participation or even the, the benefits of education, you know, we operate in a social context. And so what you're seeing are a couple of things happening. So one um, is the jobs that are available to women don't necessarily match their needs or their skills, um, would have been traditionally available. We have transportation and safety issues. And there's also really you know, fairly strong patriarchal norms around you know, should women be leaving the home to work, depending on a host household's economic status. So you're seeing something really unique. And I would argue we have it, we just don't know enough about the relationship between work employment, access um, to your own income. And this is something Save Us would have pioneered thinking about when a woman has control over her own resources economically, does that also improve her health? And we just don't know enough um, about that. But that mechanism, I often wonder, it's not, it can't just be a knowledge one. It has no. to be improved knowledge, um, probably more demand um, for services. But if that is also mediated through labor force participation, we're looking at a very different situation in many states in India. Yeah. I mean, even in Delhi, where I live, um, I think it's about 18 percent is the female labor force participation. Mm. It's very low. And That's increases. very low. Yeah. So I think there's a lot more to think about uh, in terms of that. Um, sorry, is that both formal and informal? Yeah. I mean, this is based on a recent data, and I think it depends. Again, there have been studies that have tried to make sure that the informal is captured, but, you know, 90 upwards of 90 percent of labor force participation in India is informal for women. So yeah. it is capturing it, but maybe not you know, to a perfect extent. But I think the issue is we're really looking at other factors operating on what would seem to be a really natural um, progression, Great. whether they're social and they're infrastructural. Yeah, okay, that's very helpful. And thank you for that nuance because, right, um, it's hard to take one thing and, and uh, understand all the ways it plays out. I, I do want to turn to COVID. Over the last uh, two years, obviously, the world has been uh, really um, under kind of this threat. And India has gone through some interesting experiences because obviously in the beginning, you saw the very aggressive nationwide lockdown. Um, and then as the year went along, as 2020 went along, uh, and including me, I, I remember giving a talk at the end of December or January, December 2020 or, or January 21, where I was baffled by what was happening with COVID in India. And I really thought there was going to be a second wave if there hadn't been. And then, of course, what happened uh, starting in late February, but really be coming to a head in, in March into April and May was horrendous across, across India. Um, how do you think COVID is going to shape investments in public health, in health systems, in hospitals? I mean, one of the interesting things, of course, is people felt it acutely when you couldn't get hospital beds. And so you could easily imagine that the response is going to be, let's build a lot more hospitals with a lot more hospital beds and ICUs, which may or may not be the right answer. Um, but I would love to hear from you kind of more broadly, how do you think COVID is going to shape both public and private investments on health in India? So I think, um, what did COVID do to us? I think what it did to the psyche of the average person, and of course, those of us in public health is, it's a massive wake up call for everyone to see the importance of health. So if that mechanism of it for investment in health is going to be political, if it's going to be part of the media discourse daily, if it's going to be what people think about, then yes, we will see greater investments. I mean, I think we have to watch and see where those pan out and even to the extent they do, because we also had a bit of amnesia between wave one and wave two, to be very honest, we just thought it had gone um, by January, February. So when March hit, it was terrifying, I think. And it took us a little time to kind of reorient um, to that, particularly because we had Delta in many parts of the country. So that said, um, 
what else did it do? I think it woke up, you know, the hospital, the, the, the burden on hospitals was also at its root, a lot of it, the weak primary care system. A lot of the cases that could, could have been treated with oxygen, for example, in a primary care setting, a more sort of home-based or outpatient, not necessarily outpatient, but at least in a community-based setting, um, we're not. And people were running straight to tertiary care. And I always go back to the example of Mumbai, which had this incredible triage system and these ward-based uh, war rooms, where they're really able to locally decentralize, but yet still centrally manage um, testing uh, cases and also triaging levels of care. And so we had some, again, some great examples across the country where people did do this. And you saw that they didn't have the run on the hospitals. Now, there could be other reasons, the type of strain, et cetera. I mean, there's, I think there's theories on that. But the fact of the matter is, I think what it really hit home for those of us in public health was primary care as well. It wasn't just the hospital. So let me ask you, ask a bit yeah. about that, because one of the things that's been interesting is, and I'm thinking of some of Jishnu Das's work on this mm -hmm. uh, topic as well has influenced my thinking on this. Um, but it is absolutely true. And this is, I'm going to ask you if this, to what extent this is cultural, to what extent is this elsewhere, that, that when people get sick, um, there very much is a sense that like you want to end up in a, in a tertiary hospital, because those are the, that's the place that can actually do the right things. And I guess I mentioned Jishnu's work as a way to remind us that people are not totally wrong, that there's a lot of poor quality primary care. And so do you think people were being irrational by bypassing kind of primary care and coming to the tertiary centers? And how do we build up a primary care infrastructure uh, that people are willing to go to and want to go to, as opposed to have to go to if they don't have another choice? Mm. So my, one of my first studies I ever did at SEVA was I looked at um, our insurance, we had a microinsurance program, and I looked at the leading reason for claims amongst adult women. And these are hospitalization claims. They had to be 24 hours. Yeah. It was diarrhea. It was diarrhea for adult women. So as coming to your point about, you know, practice driving research questions, I went and did a study on why are women going to the hospital for diarrhea? And these were yeah. insured women. Yeah. Was on women were not, and we saw a very clear different. The odds are much higher um, for the insured. And it was just really straightforward when we interviewed them qualitatively was, well, I needed to get better and I needed to get better fast. I didn't have the time, the money, or the, you know, the sort of opportunity cost of going to one provider and the next. And almost all the studies I've worked on, we find that these, these treatment seeking pathways are quite long and, you know, winding. Yep. So people go from here to there, they're running from different providers and just work, of course, also shows that quality is quite varied and not necessarily correlated with training. So, no, I don't think people are being irrational. I think they were doing exactly where you felt that the care would be available, which again speaks back to our problem with primary care, um, that it, it's just not there to the extent it needs to be. And I think this is the case for many countries. I think many very developed countries, including the US sort of had a wake up call about, you know, in terms of public health and primary care. So in our case, um, I mean, there are a lot more investments now in these health and wellness centers, which are the public system. Now what's gonna make people go to them when they're responsive, when they're close and when they're trusted and they're treated well, we know that. But how do you, you know, I was just, again, I'm gonna use the Tamil Nadu example because I was just there last week and, you saw, you know, again, the health and wellness centers at the village level or you know, several villages um, have doctors available. They have doctors, they have medicines available, and there's a link to the household in terms of medical deli medicines delivery. These are in villages. So it is indeed possible. The question is, how will we get to those investments and prioritizing primary care over insurance-based care, which is, of course, a financing mechanism that you know, deals with our tertiary, but um, doesn't necessarily strengthen what's below. Yeah. And again, like I said earlier, we have examples in both urban and rural India. One more question on this. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I find really interesting about Jishnu's work, it, and it's not only Jishnu, obviously, there are the people mm -hmm. who've done this, um, is this whole question of informal care providers. And as you said uh, in passing, but it's to me the one of the most striking features of his work is that the correlation between formal training and quality is way weaker than we would want it to be. 
right, that you'd expect a, a fully qualified doctor to be dramatically better than somebody who did not go to medical school. And we don't see that consistently in India. And, and um, so that, that has struck me as really uh, important. How do you think about the informal healthcare workforce in India and from a both policy and a strategy point of view, kind of how do we, how do we use them more effectively? I mean, there are people who just think all those people are quacks and we should just put them in jail or just put them out of business. But they, of course, provide such a large chunk of care for people. Um, what's your mental model for how to handle the large informal kind of workforce, uh, healthcare workforce? So if I look at, again, from the point of view of people, and most of my work is with women, so I'll look at it from the view of women. Um, so who's close to home? Who can you trust to speak to you with respect? And who can you trust to do something? I mean, there's also this desire that something should be done. And that goes back to another topic around sort of basic health awareness and understanding. But if I were to talk about the providers, that's what people want. And in many of the studies we've done, and of course, national data also show that the first port of call tends to be who's closest. Um, so that is either going to be a community health worker if they're trained and for that specific issue. The informal, the formal, I don't think people make that differentiation as much as they make on trusted versus non-trusted. So you really need to understand what drives that trust. And I think that trust, a lot of it comes from action, follow-up and the ability to access somebody because people access, I mean, even, you know, in a lot of my qualitative and quantitative work, we've seen these pathways that are very similar. You start with one, if that didn't work, you go to the next and you go to the next and you do end up traveling distances, but people negotiate. So I think what we need to do is to ensure one, people have the choices between trained providers and qualified doesn't necessarily mean trained, does it? I mean, in terms of that continued medical education, let's say, yep. or you know, and we also have a highly um, unregulated system in many ways. So to put in those structures to be monitoring the sort of outcomes that we need to be monitoring at the population level is probably also another place to start. So do people who go for, whether it's basic communicable disease or for diarrhea, are they getting treated in a short span of time and ideally um, with almost no out-of-pocket expenditure? Yeah. And these are the questions we should be asking. These are the questions we should be monitoring yeah. are really the treatment seeking pathways, yeah. which there's very little known. There's very little known, right? There's very little known. And we have this sort of simple mental model of you go to primary mm -hmm. care and if they can't handle it, you go to a secondary or tertiary care center, but it's largely not how the world actually works. No, and I think we see that in so many areas. I mean, in women's health, it's, it's so clear, you know, we run from permanent solution to solution. You mentioned family planning, but most of it is sterilization. And then we go to like major gynecological operations later in life, as opposed to you know, going through what you would think would be a traditional, you know, primary care to tertiary model based on the severity. I mean, that's just not what you see play out in reality. Yeah, yeah. Um let me um, ask a couple more questions, and I'm part of it is also weaving in some of the things I'm seeing from the chat and uh, Q and A. Um, I do want to talk about, and I do want to shift to this conversation that you and I had when we saw each other in Providence around global health. And I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to ask you a hard question. To start. I mean, a lot of these have been hard, but this one, which is, when you hear the term global health, what do you think? What does it mean? And how, and then the second part that will follow is how is it changing? How has it been changing over the last decade, but particularly in light of this pandemic? But let's start with, I say global health. What, what is that? What, what do you hear? What do you, what do you think I mean by it? I always start and say, I don't work in global health. And you I don't work in global health. I always start with that. I work in India. I don't work in many other countries or any for that matter. I have colleagues. And I think it's, I say that on purpose because I think the, the way in which we be, global health has been defined has been um, at least in the last 20 or 30 years been really driven by um, higher income settings or better resource settings in terms of both institutional funding, universities, um, donors, et cetera. And I think it's a real problem. I mean, I think there's a great conversation right now emerging in medical journals, probably amongst very elite people in public health, but still it's a start to say, well, what is this when we mean, I mean, who, who's defining these questions? Who's defining the ways in which we prioritize, whether it's research or practice? Um, 
many of it, much of it comes to the funding, but also if the, the traditional you know, sort of definition of global health also weaves inequity in its sort of transition from an international health model. When I was at Harvard, it was PIH, it was Population International Health, and now I believe it's global health, right? So there was this transition to look at equity and to look not just North-South but to think more about the world and to think about inequities within countries. And I think that's fantastic. However, from where I sit, I'm not sure I could say with great confidence that that's been um, implemented in practice in terms of really reshaping what that means in terms of equity in practice. Um, whether it's the way resources are done, whether it's the way who decides priorities or even um, partnerships and the idea that capacity is built one way, I think is just so deeply problematic still that I think we have a long way to go before we come to a definition of global health and reality and practice that is true to what I think its philosophical sort of underpinnings are. So let's stay on this. Um, it's interesting, I always think about uh, the history of the evolution of the term, and you kind of alluded to this with international health and, and before international health, we called it tropical medicine, right? And, and I, even the great school that you went to that I love and have so many colleagues who I admire, LSHTM, is named on that tradition, of London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and there has been this effort at evolution, certainly in the terminology, but then the question is, have we moved enough in our evolution, in our thinking? Um, I love the fact that you started with, I don't work in global health. Um, and this, is, this raises the question of who does work in global health. But let me ask a very specific question, which is, do you think that the agenda of the major funders of global health, the Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, uh, certainly some of the countries, WHO, do you think they're not the agenda of what's most important for countries? Do you really think they're misaligned with what people in India or people elsewhere um, would argue are the most important and pressing issues? And if, the, if there is misalignment, how big a misalignment is there? Well, I think they vary um, in terms of who's funding programs versus research. And I think a lot of research that funds in-country research probably is more aligned with what researchers are keen to study in country. So when we talk about the program funding. No, I don't think it's necessarily misaligned, but I always ask about the process that sort of define those priorities. And for example, I mean, a lot of the focus that say that's been historically on maternal and child health has been of course warranted um, because we've had poor indicators, but at the expense of health systems or primary care is often a question we ask. I mean, you know, sitting as a recipient of funding, I remember um, years ago, um, SEVA always took a very primary care approach and we had donors tell us, well, that's fine, just report the maternal care part, which I thought was always quite interesting, but that was, you know, the sort of, you know, negotiations we make. So I wouldn't say it's misaligned, but I do wonder about the process that A, led to it, and B, is it expansive enough to reflect priorities and their nuances and diversities? I think a lot of that misses out on the sort of variation within country, for example, or amongst different types of people uh, because of how these priorities have been set, if yeah. that answers. Great, so let me, it feeds into one of the most one of the biggest questions that comes up a lot in global health, which is this issue of vertical versus horizontal programs, right? That mm -hmm. if you look at a country like the United States, they have been very willing to put large dollars into vertical programs like PEPFAR. Uh, and let's be very clear, PEPFAR has been phenomenal. Like it's just been massively successful in saving millions of lives. So it isn't that vertical programs are not effective. And in fact, part of it is when I still speak to US policymakers, members of Congress, their love of vertical programs is, I know what I'm paying for, I can measure it, I can see the impact. And then they say, Ashish, you talked to me about investing in health systems. And I'm like, that's vague. And like, what does that mean? And what am I investing in? And how will I know if it's working? How do you, first of all, do you, do you understand? I mean, I'm sure you understand that argument, but how do you counter it if you even want to counter it? I think it's something we face quite regularly on a micro level as well with donors wanting to see impact of X or Y. It's natural. I mean, there's, a, I think, increasing sort of culture of return on investment. Um, but, you know, at the expense of what, this was a question, you know, um, I think researchers have to justify less than people who are program implementers or policymakers. But in terms of those time spans, I think what you're talking about is, yes, absolutely, PEPFAR, 
um, some of the TB programs, you see the polio program in India, and then you've seen, seen excellent results because of a vertical line. But what we haven't asked is at the expense of what when it comes to other types of care. And I think COVID is another great example. So when the world, or if I look from my perspective, when everyone's eyes honed in on COVID because we had to, it was really at the expense of really basic immunization and maternal and child health care. So where to take that and apply it to what you just asked and look over a longer period of time, you may find similar sort of trade-offs are just very difficult to study and have a conversation about because naturally people say well we're not there to invest in a country's primary priority which should be building its own health system and you know those are again bringing back to the politics i think these are political conversations and of the role of donors and where they sit in terms of the some of that priority setting it's it's contentious yeah um and do you worry i worry I'll start with that. Mm -hmm. I worry that coming out of COVID, uh, there's going to be a lot of interest in building up capacity for disease surveillance, for mm -hmm. responding to infectious disease threats, but less interest in building that underlying kind of health system, at least from international donors, from governments and major funders. There's going to be a lot of focus on let's make sure we don't get another COVID in the future. Uh, and that might, in fact, do exactly what you're worried about. So is that, I mean, is that, is that a concern for you coming out of COVID or do you think we're gonna be smarter in our investments and think a bit more broadly? Well, I don't think there's any one investment, but what's something that's interesting, I think a lot of the things people have talked about investing in surveillance, provided it's not only COVID surveillance, I mean, surveillance systems are incredibly important and you know need to be more robust in probably most countries of the world. So that sort yep. of surveillance and monitoring, um, I think, again, in terms of primary care, close to home delivery systems, those are adaptable. And you do see that in states that had strong primary care systems, their response was different. So if we were to learn from who did better or where you saw performance differently, perhaps it wouldn't be that case. I don't, I don't think we can uh, predict that quite yet, though. I still think we feel like we're still in the midst of it. We are still in the midst of it. Um, in, in the few minutes we have left, and by the way, this has been really terrific. Thank you. A couple of quick questions. And I, one is a bit um, almost parochial, which is, um, so I'm at a U US university, as you know, and I think a lot about what is the right role for American universities like Brown in engaging on improving public health and healthcare and health systems in India. Uh, obviously something I personally feel very strongly about that, that we should be doing that. Um, but how, how best to go about do that, doing that? Like, how do, we, how do we do it in a way that's effective, that's sustained, that's long-term, that's not extractive, that's impactful? Kind of in general terms, how do you think about the role of where, where universities like Brown can play a helpful role? Well, I think if Brown does it the Brown way, it will be different. I think there are already models of how American universities set up in countries, of, you know, whether it's a center or perhaps research in partnership with others. And that's fine, that's important. But I think I would actually put it back to you and challenge Brown to do it differently and to really think about you know, those deep engagements with practice that I know you do in the United States to think about how to replicate those sort of um, models in a place outside of America, you know, whether it's in India or other countries in which you may work. So I think one there in terms of really being closer to practice, so doing that differently and that would require a different orientation. I mean, the branding wouldn't be a university center, so to speak, but I think deep partnerships. And there are examples of this, as you and I have discussed, um, you know, at a smaller level through universities, but I would also challenge public health education, having been through tons of it. Um, and I would argue it's a you know, very good <laughs> institutions, I would say there's something really deeply lacking in the way we think about theoretical public health education um, in terms of practice. I mean, I remember showing up to SEVA after my Harvard degree and feeling, I'm never feeling so unequipped to actually deal with monitoring and evaluation, something I did learn um, while there in practice. And I would challenge you to think about what does exposure mean? I think there are certain public health schools that do short trips or they demand an internship abroad. 
you can go much further than that because the capacity building is really two ways, you know, throws people, throws students out there the way the Brack School of Public Health even does within Bangladesh and say, you will work on a problem for an extended period of time to gain a public health education alongside the, te the technical education we all need in methods um, and in thinking about public health issues. Very few universities do that. And I think it's an opportunity to do that in partnership. So the capacity building is two ways um, in a place like India or other countries. And you don't see that model where students here can actually contribute to education there and vice versa. And vice versa. So let me just work on that a bit more and say, so we have our master's degree, for instance, is a two-year degree. Um, we obviously have people who go off to places for summers. But what I'm hearing from you is um, to go much deeper and further than that. And so could you could we imagine a program where you spend your first semester here, get some basic stuff, but then you spend a large chunk of your other 18 months in India and then maybe getting some education. I mean, I'm just trying to think through how, because the problem is mm. we don't want to extend the education. Um, I mean, we can, but it has its own costs. Um, so how do you incorporate much more of that experiential and problem solving, problem based learning without kind of blowing up the whole thing? Or do we need to blow up the whole education? I'm, I mean, I'm game for like rethinking the whole strategy on how to teach, uh, you know, public health. But I'm trying to think about what what would you recommend or and not specifically to Brown, but just in general, how do we do this in a way that's sustainable and effective? I've thought about this a lot, and I think there could be two ways. So one could be thinking about during that course of education, perhaps not the six and 18, because you do need some of that basic methods training, et cetera, and also that peer group is so important yeah. um, to develop in public health school. But you know, I always make this sort of maybe bad comparison with medicine and saying that, look, I wouldn't want to be operated on someone who hasn't done a residency. And why we think that you know a master's program stops at the two years and doesn't have a period of practical, maybe it's a fellowship, perhaps it, it should be paid. So you feel like you're entering the workforce, but without that practical training, yeah. a lot of public health graduates get fairly like important jobs, probably too early, just because of the way the global health system is structured. So you're sitting in headquarters, sort of backstopping and providing technical support to a place you know very little about. So I That's think thinking about practical training, the yep. way we think of residency and medicine yep. would shift mental models a bit. I like that. Because ex expertise is gained by practice. I also think you need, um, you know, look, COVID has taught us this, isn't it? That we can do so many things remotely. So imagine you have, you know, teachers from around the world as well. You have students from around the world interacting, vice versa. I think we can be really creative if um, schools want to. Yeah. Well, let me, um, we are at time and let me end on that note because I would say that we certainly want to and I, I feel like at our school, because Brown has a long tradition of this and I want to go back to where we started this conversation. Brown is a place I think that is willing to think differently about these kinds of problems and really ask the question, how do we redefine education in a way that's impactful? Uh, and you are a brilliant example of that um, in terms of how you started off as a pre-med student uh, doing international relations. And now you're thinking about things that are both very related to where you started, but also very different. Um, so Sapna, thank you. This was a lovely conversation. I felt like I learned a lot. I'm really grateful for your time. And uh, it was just great to catch up and to chat about a whole set of really important issues. Well, thank you so much. It was so much fun. And really, I credit a lot to Brown. So thank you again for having me at Brown. I really appreciate it. All right. See you soon again, hopefully in Providence. Bye-bye.